great to be here with you and uh, have an opportunity to share from the scriptures this morning. Um, that function that happened here last night was actually a fundraiser for a Madagascar mission trip. Uh, Seth and Cheryl are taking a group across to Madagascar in May, and so just exciting to be able to uh, partner with other churches and to do some work for the kingdom of God in our region in the Indian Ocean. So this morning I'm going to share, um, I have a little bit of a personal story to tell, and then I'm going to be sharing from the scriptures and uh, talking about how God works in situations that uh, maybe don't always feel like He's working or uh, can be a little challenging. And uh, just to share a little of our story over the last uh, couple of weeks, we have a daughter, Hannah, who many of you probably would never have met. Um, she's uh, our middle child between Timothy and Luke, and uh, she did her high schooling, last part of her high schooling here in Mauritius. She finished matric or the equivalent in 2019, and uh, then she went actually to do a gap year similar to what we're doing in the OASIS program uh, across in South Africa in Durban. But Hannah had a dream to study internationally. That was uh, her, her desire, her heart's desire was to study at an international university. And uh, she had her heart set on Canada, actually. That's where kind of there's a big program for social justice kind of work. That's the field that she wants to be in. And uh, she set her heart on studying in Canada, totally and utterly outside of the realm of our ability to achieve. In her heart, a desire to study in Canada. Over the course of 2020, she applied to different universities, obviously for the degree itself and for financial aid, and uh, kind of coming towards the midway through that year, and a uh, couple of doors had closed already. There was one door that was partially open, but still needed some financial support, and then there were the South African universities where she had applied, which are also good universities and would have given a good education, just not the dream, you know, for Hannah. And uh, we got to that stage about halfway through the year where um, we were kind of saying, okay, it looks like it's not going to happen. We've put ourselves out there. We've tried. It doesn't seem like it's going to come together. Um, let's put our attention on the South African universities where you can study. And just then, we got an email from that one partially open door in Canada, Trinity Western University, a Christian college, and they offered her an additional scholarship that kind of just pushed it into that space where it was almost possible and good enough for us to take a leap of faith. Long story short, she started online, moved to Canada in 2021, and we watched from a distance as she's kind of developed this uh, experience of studying and living in Canada, got to see some of her friends and pictures of her friends, got to hear some of her experiences. Uh, she spent about six months in Ottawa on a leadership program and just got to mingle with incredible people. One week she sent us a photo of herself with the previous prime minister and then a week later herself with the current prime minister, Justin Trudeau, in her like circle of uh, you know, uh, functions that she was attending, a picture of her and the current prime minister of Canada. In the meantime, we had some dreams of our own. We thought Lee and I, she's been there four years now, that uh, this time of year now, April's when she's graduating, we would love to take a trip to Canada ourselves to see her space, to look around her university, to meet some of her friends, to kind of see her life that she's building for herself in Canada. And we set our little dream on a trip to Canada to witness her graduation. And uh, we saved up. We kind of bought our tickets in January. We applied for a visa, 6th of February. I've got that date edged in my mind now, um, brutally scarred. Um, we applied for leave from our employees. It's hard to get leave, you know, it's in some situations. And uh, you've got to really hustle your way into some leave. Conversations with Hannah. What are you going to show us, Hannah? What sites can we see? What can we do together? Where are the best coffee shops, you know, all important things like that. How are we going to spend our time in Canada? Uh, but last night, we were on a WhatsApp video call with Hannah while she was curling her hair and preparing herself to attend her graduation. Lee was giving her advice about how to manage those curls and keep them from dropping. Me too, I was giving advice. <laughs> Somehow, um, not really, you know, getting much traction with my contributions. And uh, this morning, in the early hours of this morning, three or four o'clock this morning, she walked down the aisle, she picked up her degree, she probably threw her hat in the air, and Hannah graduated while we sit 15,000 kilometers away. It turns out that the visa application process is a bit more traumatic than I anticipated. And uh, it looks like at the moment, it seems like people applying for Canada visas in South Africa are waiting up to six months to, to get that visa. We had no idea. Tried everything. Escalated the application on the website, sent emails, 
employed an agent on our behalf in South Africa. Eventually, when we weren't getting through, I wrote a letter and I couriered it to the High Commission of Canada in South Africa in the hope that someone would have to open that letter and read my case. Nothing. No reply. No hope. We prayed. We prayed and we prayed and we prayed. People in Mauritius prayed. People in Canada prayed. People in South Africa prayed. We were hoping to get to Canada for that occasion. I held on to the tickets until like we had no choice but to cancel. And the last day of Hannah's exams, when she just finished her final exams, we had a video call where we just said, okay, Hannah, we, it's not going to happen. We're not going to be there. A lot of tears that day. One or two since as well. I'm not really an emotional guy, but, you know, some people have been <laughs> crying. That's a little too robust, that laughing. I mean, have a heart, guys. We still don't have our visas. We don't know if we'll get a chance to, to get there in this summer holiday break of hers at all. We've spoken about her coming out here, but she has to apply for another visa herself. She's got to move from her student visa. She can't really leave the country while it's in progress. We've got some experience now with applying for permits. We don't take anything for granted. We're not sure if we'll see Hannah right now at this time of year. And uh, as challenging as that is for us, and it has been deeply challenging, I know that there are also situations in this room that are even far more challenging. Situations where people are facing a real difficulty that seems insurmountable. For some, it could be health, uh, things that uh, may be even life and death. Financial disappointments where people might be at risk of losing everything. Literally everything you have could be at risk. Could be relationships. You might have sown into something, tried everything possible to save a relationship, but no matter what you try, it's slipping out of your hands. Every one of us faces disappointment in some way or other, some of them more extreme than others. But what do we do when we get disappointed? What do we do when life seems unfair? How do we respond when our prayers don't get answered or they're not answered in the way we want them to be answered? I want to turn our attention this morning just to a, a tiny scripture in the book of Romans. It's Romans 8 verse 28. It's been helping me and I hope it helps you this morning. Romans 8 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. We know. How can the Apostle Paul use that word? I can understand we believe. I can relate to we believe. I believe that God is able. I believe that God is powerful. I believe that God is sovereign. I believe in the character of God. If you tell me we believe, I can buy into that. If you tell me the scriptures teach, I can, I can buy into that too. The scriptures do teach that God is able, that God does work things together for good. If you tell me the scriptures teach it, I can see it clearly. I think about the, the story of Joseph and his emergence out of prison to the state of prime minister. I can see that God works. Nowadays, it's quite common for people to rise to power out of prison, happening all the time. Sometimes you think the politician should be in prison and the other ones should be out of prison. But in Joseph's time, it was pretty rare. This idea of kind of emerging out of a prison cell into the prime minister's office, we can see if we read the scriptures, God works things for good. How can he say, we know? If we say we know, it implies something in me. It's, I've, there's a character in me I know. It's not, I believe about God, that implies something about God. The scriptures teach it's something about the scriptures, but if I say we know, it implies something about me, I know. Something in me is confident, something in me is totally secure. God works all things together for good. And I think the reason that Paul can come to that statement is, is hidden in the, in the text that he's writing overall. The book of Romans is, is a, writ, a written letter about the gospel, it's about the good news of Jesus. The whole letter is an argument. It's discussing the death and the resurrection of Jesus. It's hoping to point people to faith so that they might believe in Jesus themselves. It's helping Christians to understand the implications of what Jesus has done for us. It's all about Jesus, his death and his resurrection and what it means for the Christian faith. That's where our little verse resides. And that's significant because it's out of that context that Paul is able to say, we know. And the reason is because he's looking at that crucifixion day that we've just celebrated a month or so ago in Easter. And he's looking at the, in a sense, the disappointment of that day. 
and thinking about how God worked such incredible good out of such incredible darkness. And that must be a sign that gives us an indication of what God is able to do. We know because we look at what happened over Easter, the passion of Jesus, and we can be totally convinced God can take the very worst and turn it into the very best. On that day, Good Friday, that we celebrated recently, and we've spoken several times over the weeks even that follow, but that was a dark day. On that day, Peter denied Jesus. On that day, Judas betrayed him. On that day, they plotted to murder the Son of God. On that day, there was violence like you cannot believe, an aggression against another human being that was completely innocent. On that day, the disciples of Jesus lost all hope. They were scattered, all of them. All disappeared. They mourned their tears. They buried him in the tomb. Some of them started leaving the city. They had lost all hope that Jesus was going to be someone that would bring them salvation in this way of life. And yet, it wasn't the end because that Resurrection Sunday led to the most incredible good that's come to the human race. The forgiveness of sins, the reconciliation with God, peace with ourselves and peace with one another, the ability to walk in freedom and liberty, to not have guilt or condemnation hanging over our lives, such incredible good out of such incredible darkness. And as Paul writes about the wonder of this salvation that God has worked on our behalf, he can stop in the middle of his letter and he can say, we know, we know. Because if God can take the worst day in human history and make it the best day for the human race, we know He can do anything with what's happening in your life and mine. For Paul, it's not just theory. He writes of himself as the worst of sinners. When he thinks about his life before he met Jesus and his own murderous intentions towards Christians, the way that he persecuted the faith, he writes with a sense of passion, I'm I'm the worst of sinners, he says, and God saved me, he says, to put me on display so that everyone would see if God can save Paul, he can save anyone. He sits real for Paul, the reality of that salvation, the incredible good that God did for him on that day sets him a foundation in which he can say, we know God can do anything. Later on in this chapter, Romans 8, if I read just a few verses, scattered verses from then on, verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him give, graciously give us all things? Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword? Verse 38, for I'm sure, I'm sure, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. What he did for Jesus lays the foundation for your and my Christian faith, our journey, our day-by-day walk with God. If you put your faith in him for salvation, if you believe that Jesus died on the cross for you, if you consider that God turned that day of wickedness into a day of great rejoicing, then you can know God will work all things together for good in your life and in mine. The next thing that stands out to me as I read this verse is that God works. God is working. It's not God is overseeing, God is managing, God is supervising, God is observing. God is working. We know that in all things God is working. It's not that common that we think of God as working, but it's something that Jesus also said about God. In John 5, 17, he says, My Father is always at his work. He's always at his work. He's always doing something. He's not passive. He's not on the outside. He's on the inside of your life, and he's working. How does God work? Sometimes, of course, he works in a miraculous way, instantaneous answer to our request. A person gets healed. 
instantaneously, miraculously, something God has done. No one else could take uh, like the credit for that. It could only be God. A door opens that till now has been closed. A, a scholarship is offered and someone can study overseas. A contract is awarded. A payment is made. A decision goes in someone's favor. All these things, God can be working instantaneously, making a moment change by the power of his work. We're not in heaven yet. One day, God's kingdom will be fully established and there'll be like perfect, perfect life with God in heaven. But right now, we live in an age where it like breaks in. If, from time to time, it breaks in. There's a miracle. There's a breakthrough. There's a door that opens. It's a sign of what's coming. It tells us what God is like. God is working in our lives sometimes now by miraculous ways. Sometimes God works over a long period of time. It's not uncommon for God to promise something and then wait some time for it to be fulfilled. We know the big stories in the Bible. Abraham waited 25 years for Isaac. 13 years from the time Joseph had his dreams about being prime minister to the time he ascended to that position. We know people ourselves who've waited 10 years to fall pregnant, trusting, waiting, hoping. Others who got married late in life, hoping for a partner, but it happens later in life. Many times people don't get to see the answer in the time frame that they hope for or that they're longing for, but God is working even in that situation. Sometimes people die without seeing the answer to their prayer. It's still coming. I think of people who've prayed for an unsaved spouse or a child that's far from God, passes through to the other side, and later on, the child just turns in response to Jesus. Never got to see it, but it's still fulfilled. God working through our lives. Sometimes God works through providence. He takes the events that are happening and he weaves them into his final purpose. Think of Joseph, that very story of the man who was sold into slavery, um, served as a servant, thrown into jail. All of these events that were definitely intended for his harm. They were situations that were put to, to Joseph to destroy his life in a way. But God takes that very thing and he weaves it in to the point where he becomes prime minister. So he can't become prime minister without that thing that's happened in his life in the past. It's providence. God takes something and he uses it to achieve his purpose. Same way Esther became queen. It's the same way Paul ended up preaching to Caesar in Rome as a prisoner, standing trial, fulfilling the prophecy about him years before to preach before Caesar. Providence can result in our protection. You might not even know the times God's providence has been at work in your life. You have a flat tire. You're not somewhere where you should have been, and it's good for you because something happens that you're protected from. God does more than we think in ways that we can't even imagine. But God's providence doesn't even have just to do with our own journey. It's got to do with the whole journey or His purposes in all of life. God is working in Everywhere and in every situation, the ESV translation of this verse that we're looking to, it says all things work together for good. It's like he's taking everything together and working for good. It's not just about your situation, not just about your moment in time. I think about Zechariah and Elizabeth that were older couple, wanted to have a child and were barren. Living through that trial, barrenness, barrenness, wishing to have a baby, wishing to have a baby. The importance is that they had the baby, John the Baptist, who had to come at the right time. The birth of John the Baptist was not just about the barrenness of Zechariah and Elizabeth. It was about the coming of Jesus. It was about the way that needed to be prepared. It was about the full picture of God's purposes in the world. It's not just about what's happening in your life. He's taking all things together, working them all together for good, for those who love him, who are called according to his purposes. Sometimes God is working by leading us, directing our steps, putting something in front of us and asking us to step into it. I think of Paul's vision of the Macedonian man to come and preach in Macedonia. It was led by God. It's, it's God working out his purposes. He's, he's struggling. He's in a trial. He can't find access to do ministry. Doesn't know what to do, where to go, and God leads him into a new place. That's a way in which God works. 
Peter, same story as he preaches to the Gentiles. All through the scriptures, we have these examples. Sometimes it's, it's by conviction. Conviction rising up in the heart. I think of David, that young shepherd boy who was going to fight Goliath. It's like this conviction grows up in him. And he could do nothing else except fight Goliath. He didn't have to do it. He wasn't required to by law. It wasn't his job. He wasn't even a soldier. But this is conviction that rises up. It's God working in his life, bringing him through that trial. God is working all the time in so many different ways. But he's also working for our good. He's not just working in the situation. He's not just working out his purposes. This verse says he's working for our good. That means that he's doing something in your life while you're facing a trial and persevering through a disappointment. Romans 5 verse 3 says not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. There's something good for us in persevering. That's what this verse says. Something good, we rejoice because it, endurance produces character. There's something about growing up. We grow up when we have to face disappointments and when we have to persevere through a trial. The nature of a child is to throw a tantrum when they don't get their way. If an adult throws a tantrum, we don't think it's so cool. We also don't think it's cool when a child does it. But, you know, we teach them to get out of that and into an, a mature way of approaching life. And God uses these things in our lives where we don't understand all the time or when it's challenging and we have to persevere through a situation that causes us some pain or some heartache. He uses it to do some work in our heart and in our character and to mature us so that we get to a place where we realize it's actually not all about me. It's not all about me and what's happening in your life. How can I serve you and how can I help you? And I don't need everyone to kind of be around and to help solve my problem I'm just going to walk through it as a mature human being, a person of faith, because that's what we need to do to grow in our knowledge of God and our walk of faith. It's not just to do with character, it's also to do with faith. In Peter, it tells us that, you know, we face trials so that the tested genuineness of our faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Trials test your faith. It makes impurities rise to the surface like fire does to a furnace. And sometimes those impurities are not very pleasant. When you face a trial, things that come to the surface of your life are things like impatience, anger, offense, doubt, anxiety, fear, low self-esteem, unworthiness, comparison, jealousy, criticism. Religious masks that we put on just to pretend that everything's okay. All these things come to the surface of our lives as we face our trials. And the purpose of that is so that you can see them. The purpose of refining gold in the fire is so that those things come to the surface. You can see that they're there and you can get rid of them and purify the gold. It's an opportunity to refine your faith. To see the reality of the human fleshly way respond to things and to say, God, help me get this out of my life so that the faith that I have may be pure and tested and may bring you glory. The greatest purpose of the human life is to bring glory to God. The Westminster Catechism, it's a, it's a statement of faith, a statement of practices that many churches use. I think it's Presbyterian by origin. But the first question that gets asked in that catechism is that, what is the chief end of man? What's the purpose of humankind? And the answer is, humankind's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. To glorify God, for our life to bring glory to God. You know, when we persevere through a trial, other people witness the work of God in our lives and it causes them to honor God. I don't know about you, but when I'm walking with someone that's facing a trial and they do it with such incredible grace and humility and honor to God, it's actually inspirational. 
We end up admiring that person, even maybe jealous of what God is doing in their life and their relationship that they have with God because of the way in which they're persevering through a trial. It's developed their character. They're mature. It's refined their faith. It's pure. And now it's bringing glory to God because everyone can see, wow, that is incredible. What's amazing to me is sometimes you'll find people who've walked through a trial looking back and saying they would choose to go through it again. If they had the choice at the beginning, they would go through the trial to, to experience what they have with God at the end. That's when you know God has done an incredible work in spite of the disappointments that we face. I started this preach by sharing a little disappointment of our own. Recognizing that everyone in this room has got some challenge or some trial that you're facing and some in this room have got severe trials. Pointing us to a verse that's been standing in the scriptures for 2,000 years, in the middle of a letter explaining the gospel, asking us to take note of Paul's words, to meditate on the work that God has done in Jesus, and to let that become such a solid foundation in your life and my life that we can say, we know that God is working in all the things that are happening in my life for good, my good, and for his purposes to be fulfilled. Let's bow our heads in a moment of prayer. Father, we, we look at the scriptures and we're amazed at their richness, that a tiny verse in the middle of a letter can carry such significance for every human being. We thank you that everything in the Bible eventually leads us back to Jesus. To remind us of the incredible sacrifice that you made on our behalf, the lengths that you went to in order to turn what was wicked into something beautiful. And we thank you for the confidence that that gives us to face every day of our life and every challenge that comes our way and every trial that we have to endure. And we ask you to help us to face those challenges and to get up every morning fully aware and confident that we know that God is working for our good in all things. Help us to have the humility, not to think of ourselves as being the whole story, but to know that others are facing trials of their own. Help us to mature so that we don't go through trials over and over and over again, each time throwing our own mini tantrum, but never growing in character and in faith and in giving glory to you. Help us to mature. Help us to deal with the poor motives and bad responses that emerge in our hearts so that we purify our faith. And help us, God, to honor you with our lives in good times and in bad. For your glory, in Jesus' name, amen.